invested in. We're looking forward to having a new generation of uh, computational scientists and engineers that can really take advantage uh, of the kind of computing capabilities that we deploy. Uh, and although uh, the machine that we are currently deploying sounds rather amazing at this point, uh, within a few years that's going to become commonplace and that's what all of you uh, will be using. Uh, my background actually is not in computer science, it is in chemistry. So I'm a computational chemist, uh, have been working in this field for nearly 40 years now. Uh, but was drawn to computing because the equations that we were needed to solve in chemistry to predict the behavior of molecules couldn't be solved analytically and the only way we could solve them was with computers and as computers have gotten faster and faster we've been able to do a better and better job of solving those equations and now for some chemical species the experimentalists say we don't even need to look at those kinds of problems in the laboratory because you can actually compute them as accurately or even more accurately uh, than we can measure them. So uh, chemistry, computing and chemistry has had a big Im impact on that field, sometimes completely eliminating whole areas of work uh, because it can be done better on computers now than it could in the laboratory. But even in those areas in which that's not possible, that's Computing actually provides lots of insights into phenomena that can be very difficult to uncover uh, in the laboratory. And this is happening across many, many fields in science and engineering, and I'm sure many of you know of experiences in your own fields exactly what uh, that uh, is. What I thought I would talk with you about today, perhaps to, uh, to, to give you some motivation for really paying attention to what you're going to be learning in the course, but maybe also to alert you to what's going to be the future of computing is really look at the future of high performance computing. Where are we right now and where are we going? Uh, some of you may be acquainted with this. Uh, others might find the directions that we'll be going over the next 10 years or so uh, rather remarkable. So getting on with this, uh, I'm going to talk some about directions in computing technology. Uh, as almost all of you know, I'm sure we have gone out of the Unicore era. There are very few computers today that are built with a single processor uh, on a chip. Uh, most of the laptops that you're using probably have at least dual processors uh, in them. Some of you may even be familiar with what we refer to as mini-core chips, but if not, I'll talk a little bit about the mini-core chips. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the transition from terascale to petascale computing, and a little bit about the Blue Waters computer, because this is the first computer that will actually sustain a petaflops on most science and engineering uh, applications. Uh, and then after that, I'll talk a little bit about the pathway to exascale computers, give you a little insight as to what's going to happen beyond uh, Blue Waters, and then a few take-home lessons. So let's first talk about directions in computing technology. There is a major shift going on in computing technologies, which, as I say, many of you are aware of, uh, and it's a rather profound shift. Uh, as you're going to see. I can remember in the early 2000s, not that long ago, that Intel was predicting the existence of a 10 gigahertz chip by 25, or 20, 20, 2005. Uh, clearly, we don't have a 10 gigahertz chip. We may never have a 10 gigahertz chip, and we'll talk a little bit about what that's why that's true and how it is the computing industry is actually coping with that problem. So if we looked at what happened to the performance of microprocessors over the period from the early 90s up into the early 2000s, what we saw was a dramatic increase in the frequency of the chips. It's hard to believe that back in 1992 and 1993, we had really fast chips and they were running at 66 megahertz. Of course now all chips are running at multiples of gigahertz and what you see here is that increase in the frequency and the reason that that's important is that as noted by Bokar, uh, roughly 80% of the performance gains to date is because of that increase in frequency. 
But what you see in 2003-2004 time frame is a flattening uh, in that curve. The flattening in that curve is due actually to very simple physical problems. As you decrease the feature size and you increase the frequency of the chips, something called leakage current comes into play. That's the current that's actually leaking out of the transistors. And how, what's it leaking out as? It's leaking out as heat. Eventually it ends up generating heat. So as the feature size decreased, as the chip frequency increased, the amount of heat given off by the chip increased fairly dramatically. It increases like the second or third power uh, of the voltage. And so we see that by the time we're getting into the Pentiums, those chips were running pretty hot, just as hot as a hot plate. Any of you who have actually set your laptop on your lap know that they generate a significant amount of heat. Uh, by the time we got to the Pentium 4, the Prescott, they were giving off as much heat per square centimeter as a nuclear reactor. And you can see the rocket nozzle up there. It was clearly headed in that direction. Well, that's an unsustainable path. Uh, and so industry had to completely change the way that they increased the power of computing chips. And that was to go to putting more cores on the chip, not, not ratcheting up the frequency, continuing to decrease the feature size, and now using that extra capability to put more cores uh, on the chip. So this is the uh, Intel Nehelum family of chips. Uh, some of you, if you have the newer models uh, of the Apple laptops, they have Nehalen chips in them, the i5s, the i3s, the i5s, the i7s. I don't think uh, Apple is actually using any of the i3s, but they're using the i5s and the i7s. Uh, but they go all the way from two cores all the way up through eight cores. Very sophisticated design for these chips led to very significant increases in the power of the chips. But that power is coming primarily through increasing the number of cores on the chip, not by increasing the frequency of the chips. These chips still run at 2.66 gigahertz, maybe all the way up to 3.03 gigahertz, but that's it. We're not seeing any 4, 5, 6, or 10 gigahertz in the Hollum chips. And in fact, if you look at what happened in this frequency chart that I showed earlier, those last two points on them refer to the dual core and the quad core. And now, of course, we have the eight core chips that are coming online. So over the next several years, if you're going to achieve increases in the performance of the applications that you use, they're going to have to be parallel. They can no longer rely on just the frequency of a single thread to achieve increased performance you're actually going to have to program the machines to be parallel. So this is one of the big challenges that high performance computing has faced for years, but now we're facing that whether it's on your laptop or whether it's a high performance computer. Is that the only way to get increased performance is through increased increase use of parallelism. So we're talking about uh, 8x, so eight cores per chip, as I said already in 2008, 2009, by the time 2011, 2012 rolls around, we'll see 16 core chips, we'll see 32 core chips, and it's just going to increase from there. So again, parallel computing is going to become really critical, and that's one of the things that you're going to learn about. In fact, that's the primary topic that you're going to learn about uh, during the course that you're taking. But actually, things aren't going to stop there, unfortunately, because what they're currently doing is they're building full-featured cores on each of the chips and then replicating them. But is that the best way to design a multi-core chip? Uh, maybe there are other options, and some of those other options are being explored with what is referred to as mini-core chips. So we're now not talking about putting two, four, or eight, or 16 cores on a chip. We're talking about putting hundreds of cores on a chip. They're much simpler cores, but maybe that's the right paradigm for when you're really designing 
a mini core chip. So we have things like the NVIDIA Fermi, which has 512 cores on it, and we'll have a little look at that uh, later. The Intel Teraflop chip, which now they have replaced with the Intel Mini Integrated Core chips, uh, and they're talking about having many, many uh, x86 cores uh, on the chip. Um, and then AMD also is looking at putting multiple cores on the chip, augmented with actually stream processors, so one can think of those as vector units. So why is there an interest uh, in going down this particular path, looking at simpler cores? It's because those simpler cores can do, still do a lot of arithmetic, and the total throughput of the chip itself increases fairly dramatically. So this shows you over the past few years, going from the G80 processor that NVIDIA put out, all the way to the Fermi processor, which is just now being introduced. Uh, as you can see, the number of transistors has increased fairly dramatically. What's also increased fairly dramatically is the number of CUDA cores that are actually on the chip. CUDA refers to a programming style. Uh, and, and so these are very general purpose cores that they have. So from 128 in the G80 to 240 in the GT200, now to 512 in the Fermi chip. But actually, much more important than that, you can look at what's happening to the double precision performance of the chip. And a lot of science and engineering requires double precision, so it's important to keep track of what it is these kinds of chips can do in double precision. On the G80, they actually couldn't do double precision floating point. They could do single precision floating point, but you really didn't need to do double precision floating point if the only thing you were doing was rastering an image. You don't really need 64 bits to do that. That can all be done uh, in 32 bits uh, or less. But once they started doing some of the physics on the chips, so this game that you're playing where you've got a race car that's careening around the track, they're actually trying to solve the physical equations of motion for that race car and the only way to do that's actually integrating uh, Newton's equations in motion, and to do that, you need the 64 bits. So when the GT200 came out, they actually added in this double precision floating point capability. But look at the ratio between the single precision floating point and the double precision floating point. It was a factor of eight. So yes, you could do double precision, but you paid a horrible price for actually doing it in terms of performance. You lost a factor of eight. Uh, in performance. Now look at the Fermi. It's only a factor of two difference in performance between double precision and single precision, which is what you would expect. What does all of this imply? If you actually do the math, so you're talking about this is a, this is a uh, floating, uh, a fuse multiply add. So that's two operations. You can do 256 of those. Those are two flops per uh, fuse multiply add times 1.5 gigahertz, which is what we're sort of expecting the Fermi chips to, to run at. So double precision peak performance is 768 gigaflops. Now compare that to the kinds of CPUs that you have in your laptops now. They're, they're doing maybe 50 gigaflops. So you're talking about 768 gigaflops versus maybe 40, 50, 60 gigaflops that you have with the CPUs. So actually, uh, even, even the eight core in the Helums don't get up but around 100. So you're still running a factor of maybe eight or so faster with these chips. So that's what makes this particular approach using these simplified cores, very attractive is that you can get an order of magnitude increase in increase. the amount of computing power.